Hi, everybody. Right, can you take can you take a seat and we can start? Thank you. Thank you for your attention and cooperation. Um, so for the afternoon set, the second part of the afternoon session, I'm um, Emily Bell, the director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia, and just. Uh, Thank you again very much, um, Dean Bay, for having us in your magnificent school, which we're not at all jealous of, just like we're not jealous of your terrible weather. Um, I must stop going on about the weather, but it's on my mind, being British. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be joined um, by, I think, kind of one of the leading thinkers on all of the things that we've been talking about here today, which we've distilled into this idea of ethics of moderation, but it really is kind of everything from the integrity of our information system to how is our news environment um, flourishing or not fr flourishing to what are the kind of standards of free speech uh, that we should be safeguarding both here and elsewhere, and that's David Kay. Uh, and David is both um, clinical, a clinical law professor, professor of clinical law, I don't quite know what that means, apart from it's nothing to do with doctors, um, at UC Irvine. Uh, and I, I sort of follow his work very closely as well as the UN rapporteur on, and I always get this bit, a bit wrong, but it's freedom of opinion and expression, which I think is a great title, because opinion and expression does mean that, you know, there is that added it's not just about facts, it's about discourse and um, people's rights to, uh, to exchange views. Um, so I'm kind of, I want to grill Dave because I've got lots and lots of questions for him. We've got about half an hour. Um, you will have better questions than I will, so uh, after about 20 minutes, I'll open up the floor. Um, but we're gonna, David, can we sort of start by, I think we were exchanging notes on this, um, and I was saying, you know, so much has happened in the past year and a half. Um, can you just distill for us a little bit what your view is of these really sort of what seem to now be topics which are absolutely at the centre of the national debate and how we should be thinking about prioritising them? And then if we can talk a bit about how that relates to some of the topics we're talking about today into in terms of what do we actually do to create a better environment for public discourse, for the public sphere, et cetera. In 27 20. minutes. <laughs> is, this, uh, is this on? Okay. So first of all, Emily, thank you. Um, and thanks to USC Annenberg School for inviting me to participate. Um, you totally overstated uh, sort of my role in it, particularly in an environment with such amazing thinkers that I, I listened to this morning. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just really impressed with, with what you've pulled together. I guess what I would want to say to kick us off, and I'm glad we're in conversation because um, I want to hear from you too, is, um, is a question about the framework by which we think of these things. So I think we've spent a lot of time this morning and then and through the uh, early part of the afternoon focusing on really important questions about... Um, about the processes of moderation and the impact that that has both on the moderators but also on users. Um, but I think we also should step back a little bit, and I think this is where we're in a little bit of a crisis, and it, it's in the place where I'm not sure we have a common vocabulary to understand what are the norms that the companies should be applying. And, um, and this is, I think, a... I think it's a problem that involves every stakeholder uh, on, online, right? It involves both the, the user's relationship with the company because users are so often unclear about not just what the standards are. I think the companies are getting better at articulating what the rules are, but how they're implemented. I think many, many users, if not most users, are in the dark about the implementation. Then there's... Um, you know, real lack of clarity between the users and governments, because around the world we see governments criminalizing a lot of what's happening online um, and regulating it. Then there's just a huge gap between the companies and governments generally. And there was a little bit of a discussion about this in the last session about um, sort of the possibility of American regulation 
And I think it was Jennifer maybe who suggested that that, that wasn't going to happen. Or I know that was the suggestion, and I agree with that. And I think that most of the momentum is going to be coming from Europe. And we should be really focusing on the, the frameworks that Europeans use and the global frameworks that can be better articulated so that there's a greater understanding among users, among platforms, among governments, and to find you know, what's the, the appropriate framework for that. I think that's the crisis it's, in a lot of ways. It's really unusual to hear Europe spoken about in America as providing leadership, well, basically on anything, but particularly around matters of expression, because one of the things that defines European law, um, if you like, sort of towards the press versus uh, US law is that we don't have the First Amendment, we have much tougher speech laws. I hear over and over again statements like, we don't want to be more like Germany, which has, you know, it, it has hate speech laws for very good cultural reasons or historical reasons. It's recently tried to turn those into laws that apply to online platforms and find them. This is the it's got an incredibly long German name, which has been uh, abbreviated to, I think, is it the N NDZ laws? Net, Nets DG. Yeah, Nets DG. Yeah. Um, so how, you know, kind of what, when you say Europe is um, providing leadership in this, does that mean that you really think that we do need uh, the push of external regulation here in the States? And if that's the case, do we really want that to come from the existing administration? Because that would seem to be a place that most of us would not, not want to go. Okay, so I want to be clear. Um, if I said European leadership, that should be a neutral, a neutral phrasing because um, I think a lot of the regulatory push that we're seeing from Europe is actually going to have long-term negative implications for freedom of expression online. I think it's very clear, and it's across the board. It's in areas, if you think about substantive areas, like um, hate speech, and I have to put air quotes around extremism because nobody defines it, um, or, or it's sort of the processes that Europeans are adopting, which are putting pressure on the companies to take down content, I mean, really creating incentives for takedown of content um, that ultimately, and I think we're already starting to see this, um, will result in the takedown of totally legitimate expression. So when I say Europeans are exercising leadership, I just mean that they're doing something. So, um, and, and I clearly, um, I mean, I really do think that uh, regulation by, you know, by this administration or by the United States generally is likely to be negative. Um, and, but there, that's not to say that all areas um, should be free of regulation. I mean, I think that you know, things like Honest Ads Act, I mean, there might be issues on the margins where we could imagine there being um, you know, legitimate regulation. But generally speaking, when government regulates, it overregulates. And I think we should, we should fear that. But at the same time, the companies are already regulating this space. And I mean, this also goes to a question that we were discussing before, which is, how should we even conceptualize this space? Right. Is it, is it right. public space so that public norms should apply? Or is it private space so that you know, brand should be leading the way? So we are, at the moment, we have this. Um, and I think that you know, just, for, just for, 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 for people who've um, come in this afternoon, we had a closed door session this morning with a lot of the speakers that you saw earlier on um, and uh, so, uh, so some of the other kind of scholars and experts in the room just had a discussion about, you know, some of the terms of engagement around this. So that, that when we keep referring back to you this morning, um, you weren't late. Uh, but, but that question of business model and public versus private seems really critical. And one thing which is very different between Europe and the States is that America has always had, I think, great faith that the free market will somehow protect a kind of plurality of media voices, that it will elevate you know, the good over the, over the bad. That really isn't working anymore. So, so, what does, so, so does it mean when you say you know, public versus private space, how can America, st should America, first of all, should America start to think about not just having private companies in charge of all of this? 
And secondly, if it does start thinking that, what does that really mean in terms of what we need in a new civic media movement? So, I mean, that's a, it's a really great big question. I, I mean, my, my sense is, first of all, if we think of just w as one example, Facebook, right? So what, around 2 billion active users and only 200 million of them or so, so two, 200 million-ish, are in the United States. So I, I actually think, like if we're gonna be talking about platform regulation generally, we can't be thinking of, about just American law. So, you know, American law could regulate for the purposes of American users, but, but that, doesn't, um, that doesn't exclude the possibility of Europeans regulating for Europeans. I mean, so we see that in the context of the right to be forgotten, right, and the demands upon Google to take down information that's, well, to de-link information right. that's no longer relevant, you know, those kinds of issues. But that, you know, that's geographically, at least for the moment, <laughs> is geographically focused. So, so I think if, I, I'd rather us think more, um, maybe as a first order, about how the platforms are going to regulate in a way that's actually consistent with the norms that apply, at least at a baseline, apply across all jurisdictions. And that, to my mind, that should be human rights law. Right. Because human rights obligations apply um, all over the world, and that at least it, it at least creates a floor. Platforms can provide more protection in some places. So, so how would that change? And this is you know to, to a sort of a, an, uh, I'm ill informed on this, uh, but how would that change what they have at the moment? Because I'm fairly sure if you went into the trust and safety departments of Twitter or Facebook or you know, YouTube and said, you should be using human rights law as a basic kind of flaw, they would say, well, we do that anyway. You know, kind of, we, we think about that all the time. Is that, I mean, do we see, can, can we think of examples where that just doesn't apply? Yeah. So I would separate, so human rights law provides both substantive norms, but also procedural norms, like due process kinds of norms. So on the substantive side, you know, all of the companies have, for example, now, um, uh, you know, in their terms of service and community standards, prohibitions on hate speech. Uh, as a matter of human rights law, there's, there's no such thing as hate speech on its own. It's hate speech that constitutes incitement to violence or discrimination or hostility. It's still broader than we think of First Amendment law in the United States, but it still does require something more than just bad speech, whatever that is. So that's one difference on the substantive side. I also think that you know, um, a lot of the platforms, just like states, are regulating extremism. Right. And, I mean, I mentioned this before, they're not defining what extremism is, so it's providing just a huge amount of discretion, both to governments, but also to the platforms of, themselves, which, in their terms of service, of course, they reserve to themselves discretion to make these decisions, um, but, but they're not decisions that are really... Um, they don't really involve very clear appeal and so forth. So that's just on the substantive side where there could be some difference. On the process side, I mean, we, we throw around terms like um, remedy, accountability, and transparency pretty loosely. Um, but, but I think there are rules that we could look at there that would at least provide users, and I think this, to me, this is key, provide users with greater understanding of what's appropriate expression and what's inappropriate expression on their platform and what the, um, what the accountability and the remedy might be when the platform right. takes down totally legitimate content. And do we think that those are, I mean, one of the, th if you think about news organizations being intensely competitive, my experience is that that has nothing on the, the intensity of platform competitiveness in that, you know, they really, I'm looking here at someone from YouTube, they really don't like each other at all. It's like very difficult. It, I know that their lead councils kind of quite often sit together to think about these policy things, but there's not a lot of love lost. So when we're talking about these, you know, first of all, should it be one set of, you know, you're, you're suggesting a kind of a, an underwriting of standards uh, vested in human rights um, standards and law, is it realistic to think that all platforms will 
abide by that? And if they do, or if they decide that they want to adopt that, what's the kind of right mechanism for delivering it? Yeah. So at the moment, I, I don't think they would adopt that. But I think, I think the platforms should be looking to Europe and should be asking, would we prefer that? Or should we get ahead of it in some way and adopt some norms that are more articulable to Europeans and to a global um, audience? Right. Because I do think, even if, even if regulation is not coming uh, you know, in the United States, it is coming in Europe. And I think one way to get ahead of that is to, is to take steps that, that are creative, imaginative, and that are also industry-wide. Right. The thing is, right now, this is, so you mentioned competition. You know, one of, the, one of the odd things about European law right now, which is like this Nets DG, so this is, this is this new German law that puts real pressure on the platforms to take down content that's illegal under German law. Um, you know, and it imposes very stiff fines. So the penalties for non-compliance, repeated non-compliance can be upwards of 50 million euros. Yep. So um, what that kind of um, paradoxically does it is locks in these big platforms as the dominant ones in Europe. So the idea that there being competition, it's true. The platforms, you can see it in their eyes, the competition. Um, I'm, just, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, you're such a nice guy. And yeah, here we are, ca characterizing you. Just, <laughs> just having fun. But, but, I think that, but I think this is a, you know, the, the competition is very real with, among the companies, but there's no... There's no real um, viable competition from outside um, right. right now. And just to kind of, I'm going to ask for questions in one second, um, but just in terms of, you know, we're having what feels like a very rarefied, high-level mm. conversation about new types of regulatory platforms, uh, sorry, frameworks about kind of public sphere versus private company, et cetera. Um, but the kind of urgency of the situation is around seeing crisis actor videos surfacing on trending on you. You know, there is, a, there is a kind of an urgency right now. And, you know, for all of these discussions, how can we kind of, if you like, approach the urgent whilst at the same time not making what you lawyers call bad law, which is, you know, kind of the actual urgency of the situation pushing us into yeah. a place where we make regulations or we make demands which we will later deeply regret. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that, that stuff can't stop. So even while there's a lot of thinking, like the kind of thinking we've been doing all day around um, exactly high-level policy and legal frameworks or normative frameworks around that, there's still every day you know, hundreds of hours, as I think Sarah was mentioning before, hundreds of hours of video being uploaded, some small percentage of which might be, um, you know, really difficult and um, problematic and restrictable, let's say, right. even as a matter of human rights law. And so the companies still have to deal with that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting they sort of stop and, they, and while they look for some legal framework, but they still clearly have to deal with that. Um, but, but I think they should do that. Um, well, there's two, two ways to think about it, I think. One is they could do that even now by keeping, keeping in mind the regulation that might be coming and the legal framework that is articulable to all governments or should be, which is global norms, human rights law. Right. Um, and the other thing that I think would be helpful to, to us would be to know how they're making their decisions. So, you know, we, we are getting more and more transparency from the companies in terms of um, the rules that they've got, and um, and the way at the aggregate level, the way in which they respond to government requests for takedown. Right. Right. So we're getting more of that kind of transparency, and transparency and reporting, and all the major companies do it. At least all the major companies in the United States do that. But what we don't get is any transparency around their case law. Right. And I think having some bit of that would be really helpful. And of course, there's always privacy concerns and you don't want to you know, restate the bad um, content or, or republish it. Oh, and I when you say case law, just to be really clear, you yeah. don't mean literally case law. You no. mean individual, kind of how they work through yeah. principles around individual instances. I mean, yeah the, yeah, the companies are basically, there's platform law. Right. We don't call it law, but it's the implementation 
of, of the norms of the platforms. Yeah. And you know, as a lawyer, and there are other, a few other lawyers around, you know, we want to know a little bit better how those rules are being implemented in real cases. And until we see that, I think it's going to be just a rough conversation, an asymmetric conversation between all users and governments and civil society actors right. and the companies. And a plea for researchers as well, which is, you know, we've seen the APIs to all of these companies kind of narrow or, you know, there is, there is no such thing as a kind of a shared research API. So for journalists or researchers wanting to actually, you know, dig out what's going on. And as, you know, Sarah rightly said earlier on, you know, we journalists have really moved the dial and serve independent academic researchers, actually, but, you know, like many of whom we've heard from today. Um, but it's hard to do that if you have no data. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that kind of, so that might be something that we also want to advocate for. Do we have questions? Oh, we do have a question. Question over there. Oh, thanks, Sophie. Oh, you have the non you have the non working microphone. They gave that to me earlier for obvious reasons. I, I just wanted to do, to discuss uh, the normative ways in which we interrogate these concerns around regulation platforms, self regulation by the platforms. We have ample ample evidence of standards and practices by networks, television networks for decades now, who have imposed all sorts of normative constraints around language and content that were actually quite regressive. Um, we also have evidence of the platforms themselves attempting to self-regulate and contributing to shutting down and demonetization of marginalized diasporic communities. But what I want to really discuss here is the normative concerns around which we are to critique the social costs of these platforms that have yacht that don't often get raised by the platforms rightfully themselves under their, in their commercial environments without also acknowledging the social benefits. And now twice now in two, plat in two discussions, we discussed this YouTube trending video yesterday that was also featured in a really remarkable New York Times article around this that alluded to the fact that trending videos on YouTube are typically about funny people, YouTube personalities, and TV clips, failing to acknowledge that over the last week, there have been over two dozen trending videos on YouTube that dealt very progressively and critically around these horrible events in Parkland, not just talk show hosts, but uh, uh, numerous videos from the likes of Casey Neistat and Philip DeFranco, who talked very openly and have secured over two million views per video around these sorts of concerns. So I think this is a, a question here around the right. normative ways in which we critique these platforms that don't also acknowledge that there are people harnessing these platforms to engage in the sort of, sort of advocacy and activism and progressive critical concerns that we all share. Right, and that's, I mean, I think sort of following in, you know, allied to that question as well, and something David, I'd really like to hear from you on, is there are so many um, territories where uh, the kind of democratization of tools has led to, you know, real kind of change in social connectivity. And there are also terrains where there are much worse kind of problems with consistent disinformation from the state, from state media, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what can we kind of learn about those positive cases and also the cases where things are much, much, much worse? And incidentally, there's nothing new in that normative behavior. When we first started comments on the Guardian website way, way, way back, I was deluged by journalists saying, this is horrible, this is a cesspool. We actually rated all of the comments on the platform, and we found that like 2% were z one to zero star comments, and we actually had like 20% five star comments. Made no difference. We still ended up talking about the 1%, but sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is a really great, um, you make a really great point. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, one of the, one of the things that um, I think it's important that we want to protect the good progressive parts of the internet um, and social media and search at the same time that we deal with the problematic aspects. And, and I, my, my feeling is that, that the companies, just like governments, are often very heavy handed. And so in the application of the norms or even in the articulation of what the rules on community standards might be, they very often um, even though there might be a good intention behind them, they very often harm marginalized communities. They might, you know, if we're talking about, say, uh, 
um, misogyny and gender-based violence, right? So you might have a rule that in principle looks pretty good, but in application it often involves significant takedown of content related to reproductive health or something like that. So, I mean, these, there needs to be clarity around these, but also, again, there's such opacity around the implementation that it's very hard to know, apart from, you know, the occasional story like Napalm Girl and in Norway, and if people remember that, when, there was the, when Facebook took down this famous, you know, war photograph from Vietnam, um, you know, there's got to be more cases like that happening that people just don't even have the tools to complain about. So I think that, that, that part of the process issue is, is exactly about this, is surfacing these issues so that people have the tools to, to seek remedy and to appeal. I think it also speaks to, and this is a, you know, this is sort of, it, all of us are kind of responsible for this, which is it speaks to a lack of diversity in newsrooms, it speaks to a lack of diversity in platforms, et cetera, because, you know, I completely hear what you say. I don't see many kind of like young women in my classes or that I speak to or people of color thinking that actually kind of the social platforms are that great. You know, kind of it's actually sort of stopping uh, margin. You know, women in particular have been really reluctant to do their work in public as journalists, I think, as a result of some of the kind of, you know, the idea that, well, we don't want to kind of, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to stop. Like, some of this is like, this is not really abuse, it's et cetera, when you look at Twitter's response to a lot of these things. And it is very difficult, isn't it? It's kind of like, you know, if you don't, and if you don't have diversity in at the decision-making level, yeah. I mean, you don't have it in newsrooms and you don't have it in platforms. That's yeah. really hard. I, I totally agree. And that diversity is also global. Right, so um, all of the leaders of all of the companies that are dominant, and you know, of course, we're excluding. This is a conversation really about American companies, and we're excluding, you know, the Weibo's and Baidu's and Yandex and V Contacts that are that have like significant presence in their own environments, like in the billions. So I don't want to exclude them from the from the normative conversation. But the American companies are run by Americans, generally speaking, um, and. There should be more both gender diversity but also global diversity because, again, their, you know, their largest audiences, their largest user base is actually outside our borders. So I think there can be more of that. Right. right. Um, we have time for a question. Uh, okay, yeah, it's on. Um, hi, so my name is Danielle. I'm a current sophomore um, at USC. I'm studying in Dornsife, social sciences, psychology, but I'm minoring in Annenberg, so that's why I'm here. Um, but one of my classes is on international organizations, and I can't help but think about the role of the UN when you were talking about the different big companies. You see what the president does and how much influence he has. Everybody, uh, thank you very, Wait. very much. That's it for me. Thanks very much for watching. I hope that's it. In the situation where we are, we're in our front. If you can. This is a secret moderator. Up for the next breaking news, the special counsel announces new charges against Paul Manafort. This just hours after finalizing a stunning plea deal with Manafort's deputy. Yes, we could actually appear on undercover it. work. <laughs> That was, that's what the future is going to be like. Sorry, I do, I do, I do, I do apologize for, I don't know why I'm apologizing for CNN. Um, <laughs> It would they have been to better cut you if off. The other. You, that's They're right. They play, that's the Oscars playing you <laughs> off. It's like, don't, you know, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, so anyways, I can't help but think about, you know, a kind of a structure, like a, a formalized platform where all of these big companies and even globally could come together, um, especially because, you know, as the U.S.'s role back when they established the U.N. was basically like a, they had a moral obligation to lead and to set um, this framework for a greater international discussion. And because there is so much law, quote unquote, that you were talking about involved in, you know, social constructs and whatever goes on in, in um, social media platforms, do you think that there is room or they do have a moral obligation to come together um, and kind of formalize the conversation. Great question. It's a really great question. So first thing is, um, 
there's a, there's a principle of internet governance that we talk about as multi-stakeholderism, which means there are a lot of actors who are making law, essentially, on the internet, right? It's governments, so national law is still relevant. It's the platforms, the companies themselves. It's technologists, which are creating the infrastructure that actually has a very heavy influence on the content, right, and what's possible and the flow of communication. So there are all these different actors. So, you know, and some of that is under an, a, a UN-ish umbrella, very, like a soft law kind of format. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't think we want these discussions to be multilateralized in the sense that it's just governments talking about it, which is often the case in the UN, but I think you're right. We need to be thinking about whether there are global platforms that can be talking about these, that, these issues that are multi-stakeholder, that involves all of these different stakeholders. And, you know, those platforms do exist, but they're not very, they don't have much enforcement power. And we might not want them to have too much enforcement power. We might want simply, at least as a, yeah, and, and remember, these, these platforms are really young, historically. I mean, this, we're in a very early stage of, of thinking about these issues, really. And we might want to see the industry as a whole start to maybe not self-regulate, but at least adopt some common norms. And there might be an umbrella you know, related to the UN or forums like that. We're actually up to time, which is a shame, because I could easily do another half an hour on, uh, <laughs> on how it, I just wanted to ask you one very quick, tiny last question, which is just, um, we've talked about and I know I've heard you talk about kind of, you know, thinking as it were sort of outside the restraints that we've been given, you know, this problem of scale and thinking outside it. You know, if there was kind of something sort of really, that, that we have young people, we have kind of academics in this room, we have lawyers, you know, traditionally the kind of very sort of canon fodder of radicalism. If we were thinking about a radical solution, what, where might we go with that? We've been so moderate, but is there, is there something we haven't thought of? Well, it's moderation, so of course. No, so I think, um, you know, so this, Danielle's question actually points us in a, I think it's more radical than you, than you think. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to propose internet court. I mean, I really don't want to propose internet court. I love the idea of an internet yeah. court. We could... It would be on TV, because it would be a different... Well, you have a strong connection here with Judge Judy, I'm just exactly. saying. You have yeah. the right equipment here. But, but I think, you know, actually thinking about, so th this isn't totally, it's not a radical idea, but you know from press, um, press regulation around the world, particularly right. in the Commonwealth, but not in the United States, we don't really have this model, there are press councils. Right. And they, they're basically third party um, kind of evaluations of what's right and what's wrong when the media is operating. And those are not, they're not hard forms uh, you know, enforceable yeah. powers, but they do, they do have social currency. And we might think about whether there are models that are like press councils that are third party, maybe even funded by the companies, yeah. they, they should be able to do this, and also to stave off some of the hard regulation from states. But that might be one thing we would think about to, right. to try to get at least a clearer sense, a transparent sense of what the companies are doing and providing individuals who are subject to regulation some mechanism for, for appeal and remedy. Right, terrific. Um, I'm sorry, Lily, we have a question. You can always po point it at the next panel. Um, David Kay, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have one more panel to go. We have some slightly awkward choreography, literally awkward as I get off the stool. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Mike Anony, who will uh, steer us through the last panel of the day. And then we can all have a drink together and um, in, a mod in moderation, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, that's great. So, okay. Yeah, this is. So, you have your water. I do have water. Yes. Uh, there was another water. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Um, you know what? I have. Um, I have sort of have one. So. Somebody need one. How's it going? Okay.
Okay, going right into the next panel, no break, but you've got a reception ahead of you, and it's the unfun position to be standing between uh, people on a Friday afternoon and alcohol, which I feel like I'm finding myself in this position again. But um, it's a real treat to have this set of people to sort of round out and to anchor uh, the close of the day. We've been chatting for a little bit about what this conversation could be about and the kinds of topics that we wanted to raise. And what I want to do is uh, first just give you all a very brief sort of bio or a sense of who who our esteemed panelists are this afternoon, um, and then ask a question um, of all of you um, to sort of take on board. But I first want to um, introduce Anika Gupta, who is a senior product manager at The Atlantic, but most recently finished a master's degree at MIT in the Comparative Media Studies group with a focus on moderators of minority communities and how specifically they cope with online abuse and how sort of newsroom cultures intersect with those moderating communities. So happy to have Anika here. Caroline Sinders sitting beside uh, is a product analyst with the Wikimedia Foundation and an Open Lab fellow with BuzzFeed and with iBeam and has been researching and doing design research and ethnographic research researching online harassment and machine learning. So I also want to hear sort of that, that perspective of how machine learning and online harassment come together before working that foundation was with IBM Watson. So I think nicely flow across questions of moderation and tech design. Um, sitting beside Caroline is Kieran Cassidy, a filmmaker and radio documentarian. And if you haven't had a chance yet to check out the film that he uh, co-directed with Adrian Chen called The Moderators, uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's Googleable. Um, which you can you can find out for sure, but it's a it's a great watch, um, and is the winner of numerous awards for the radio documentaries and, and uh, video documentaries that he's made. And then last but not least is Professor Talia Stroud, who's visiting us from the University of Texas at Austin, where she directs the Engaging News Project, um, leading a team of researchers that look at sort of democratically beneficial, but also econom economically viable um, strategies that newsrooms might engage in as they're sort of creating new kinds of uh, moderation forms, new kinds of engagements with communities. So it's a great group um, to have together with the, the four of us. The title of this panel, though, is actually called The Ethics of Moderation Labor. And we've sort of been asking these ethics-based questions throughout the day, throughout the afternoon, if I can do a, you know, a terrible professor thing, which is to sort of collapse a big, large field of study of ethics as kind of the study and the design, the practice of what we ought to do. And I mean that, I want to do the, you know, the thing of splitting up that, that phrase of what we ought to do into sort of three bits. First, there's an implied we there. There's an implied set of who the we is, whether that's people who are impacted by systems or having to suffer under systems or getting, getting to make systems and getting to benefit from systems. And there's this question of ought. There's this question of what we ought to do. And that's sort of an aspirational moment. That's a hope moment. That's a moment that's a call for action. And then this last bit of to do is really this idea of what it is that we're going to take on board and actually do and actually take forward. So I wanted to start the panel by asking each of you, um, You've all had different experiences with content moderation communities or sort of user-generated content communities, um, whether it's with sort of ethnographic interview-based work, whether it's with design research work, whether it's documentarian work, or whether it's sort of social science research, or trying to think on a broader scale about these groups. I wanted you to ground us for a second in just sort of a description of who the we is that you were looking at in your work? Who are the people? I really want to foreground who are the people involved in the places that you were studying, the places you're designing for, the places you're documenting. Give us a sense of who the people are, what are some of the most critical uh, issues that you saw coming up in your own work? And then the last bit is to think about this notion of, of care work and of thinking about the kinds of uh, toll and sort of taxes that are placed on people who are often forced into these, uh, sometimes forced, sometimes choosing to be in these communities where they're actually having to deal with a lot of content that um, is the stuff that the rest of us don't have to see. These are the people who are seeing it. So I wanted to give sort of a, a thick description of who are the people that you are familiar with. So I'll start with Anika, please. All right. Um, so that was a multi-part question. I, I was. So I you may, yeah, I may have to, I'll who answer the, the first part, and you may have to Go jog my memory on the second. Um, yeah. But I think to start with a bit of a thick description around some of the research that I did, um, I became really interested when I was going into graduate school, and this, um, 
in this question of who is being empowered to make moderation decisions, particularly when it comes to the ways in which media companies at the time were organizing their comment sections. And it was really, it was an interesting time to be studying that because uh, a lot of companies really grappling with the future of that section. Many organizations had actually shut down and were in the midst of shutting down comment sections because they felt that they had become uh, too abusive. Um, those sections, that is. And so what I did is I spoke to a variety of different people who worked as comment moderators, or for whom that was a, a big chunk of their work, um, both in paid and volunteer capacities. Um, in the paid capacity, I spoke to people at media companies and news organizations, um, both what we would think of as mainstream media companies as well as kind of newer digital players. And then I also spoke to a lot of people who moderated online communities um, in kind of the larger uh, non-media, or well, non-news organization universe. I think those definitions can be a bit tricky sometimes. Um, but. Um, but, and my goal really there was to kind of understand, we have all of these online spaces where moderation happens. So we have, you know, gaming communities, we have um, obviously news and comment sections, we have um, online communities like, you know, Wikimedia, we have places like Reddit, we have Amazon reviews. So who are some of the people who are kind of making moderation decisions in these spaces and what links their labor? And so I think, I mean, there's just a lot that you could say about this, to be honest. Um, and it was in many ways sort of an introductory, I mean, you know, mapping that space sort of work. But I think, um, so the second part of your question is kind of what did I notice about that labor and what tied it together? And I think what was interesting from the news organization perspective is that I noticed that a lot of the moderators I spoke to were people who were steeped in journalistic values. Many of them wanted to be or considered themselves journalists. And they found themselves in a position where they were moderating either because they ran a blog or you know they were asked to by somebody else within the organization. Um, and a lot of times it was um, one of the people I interviewed described it to me as kind of the Wild West. Um, there weren't a lot of rules around what was permissible and what wasn't. They were making up rules. Organizations really didn't understand the value of comments. And that was what led to kind of these really toxic uh, combination of not just abusive comments, but also lack of any institutional idea when it came to how to deal with abuse and empower people to deal with it in a professional capacity. And so that was kind of interesting um, and awful. And then when I looked more broadly at people outside of news organizations, um, I I think one of the things I discovered that stuck with me, um, and um, I'm sure other folks will also possibly touch on this, uh, is that there were similarities across that work. And I think that one of the things that um, one of the people I interviewed said to me is that when you are working as a moderator in an online space, um, particularly in a community where you have you know, ongoing relationships, you're kind of like the host at a party. And I mentioned this earlier today as well. And, I, and that stuck with me. And I think that I saw variations of that description among people in a variety of different types of communities. So then for me, the question became, um, as media companies and news organizations employing this type of labor, how do we structure it better and acknowledge that this is part of its demands and how do we build better frameworks around that kind of work? Um, and that'll probably you know, be the second part or later parts of the discussion we have here today. Um, I think that was it. I think I've answered your whole question. Really done. So and I'll let all these other folks no part. get Caroline, out of Caroline, why don't you take us forward? That was an amazing answer, Annika. Just gonna, just gonna say that. Um, I guess, I'm trying to also now remember parts of the question. Just asking, where, what kinds of people have you been studying and working with, and what kinds of labor have you seen in, your, in the communities totally. that you've been working as? What kind of labor? Um, so a lot of my uh, research in online harassment was sort of coming from a personal place. Uh, I make video games for fun. Um, so I started studying this little-known harassment campaign called Gamergate. <laughs> Joke, because it's widely known um, to some communities. But... <laughs> But um, one of the things I found interesting was sort of starting to think about viral content and how do we exist inside of large-scale social networks that can be highly centralized. And when you think about content when it goes viral, well, where is it coming from? What does it look like? If it's on Twitter, it's attached to someone's profile. And one of the things I often encourage people to do as, as design researchers and general researchers is when you see a piece of viral content, go and click on someone's profile page, see how many followers they have. And then start to look at um, what are the amount of comments on, on this one piece that's gone viral. Um, so I was sort of interested in this idea of how do you start to think about information flow. And if you were to use any kind of uh, analytic systems, 
that were sort of looking for irregular content or irregular happenings, viral content when you don't have a lot of followers is a really great sort of uptake, right? You can see that that's abnormal. Um, how does this relate to online harassment? Well, one of the things I find fascinating is if you remove the, the context of online harassment, it can look a lot like viral content. It can look a lot like patterns we see in protest networks. Um, so the context of online harassment is incredibly important. When I started studying Gamergate, for me, um, I was uh, finishing up my master's at the Interactive Telecommunications Program, where I'd gone to go uh, work on community building and the future of photography and video games, and I was doing a lot of work with Clay Shirky. And one of the things I found really fascinating was the slow uptake that journalists had towards recognizing or calling Gamergate a harassment campaign. The original language around it was, it's infighting inside of a game scene, and it was really kind of couched in, um, I think dismissive language, since games were sort of viewed as this immature medium. Um, games are actually incredibly prolific medium. It's a billion dollar industry, it's massive. If all, of you, if all of you have a smartphone, you're all technically gamers, there's a space called Game Center in your phone. Um, there's nothing, you know, like my mom's a gamer, there's nothing casual about the way she plays Sudoku. It's very aggressive. Um, games, are, <laughs> games are a natural part of our lives, right? And so the reason I bring this up is it's really was fascinating to start to look at how victims of Gamergate were responding to online harassment, how in fact they had to act as their own moderators. And what I started to notice as I started to do ethnographic research into this because it was affecting my community was also how we started to create networks of, of uh, temporary moderators. So if a friend was being harassed, a person would offer to monitor their mention so they could log off so they weren't facing the harassment. Um, and I started to think about as a technologist, well, what are ways to start analyzing systems? Because if you have 300 followers and all of a sudden people that have never interacted with you before are interacting in your mentions, that's irregular. Uh, what are signs for this irregularity? And how do you start to analyze the ways in which our content is interacted with um, inside of these systems? How do we start to look at patterns we've already noticed from viral content? Um, so this sort of led to, this, this is something I continued studying at IBM Watson because I was working in a machine learning um, artificial intelligence based company. So I started to think a lot about well, what are ways to sort of analyze the sort of data that we're going through. Um, around this time, I actually then ended up getting a fellowship at BuzzFeed. And prior to going to BuzzFeed, I ended up spending six weeks with the Coral Project, which was really amazing. And one of the things I did was we ran a, a handful of surveys talking to different journalists about harassment that they had faced uh, in, uh, as journalists. One of the things that also I found really fascinating was, again, this idea of uh, having to sort of publish and push out your own content on site of social networks. So effectively, you're having to moderate the harassment that you're facing. Um, so if you're, if you're getting harassment outside of the, the journalistic, uh, like the CMS system you're on, like the commenting section, you're still in charge of that. But there's also this, this idea that it was also up to you to really push your content out there. So if you've written something, it needs to be tweeted. Um, most journalistic sites have uh, social media coordinators. So if you've written something, sometimes your name will get tagged to it. And again, thinking about how, do, how does viral content allow for spaces of harassment, and where are there systems that like have a lack of moderation? And Twitter is one of those spaces. Um, and then, so like putting a line in the sand now, I go to I work at a at a space where we have a lot of moderation. Wikipedia is built on what I like to call human infrastructure. Um, a lot of the work that is done is uh, checked and looked at by different volunteers, by different editors. Um, the way in which different kinds of disputes are handled inside of Wikipedia are by editors who volunteer to take on more administrative tasks. They're called administrators. And there's this whole, th these different forms of ad hoc reporting systems that our editors have created on their own. And there are different spaces that you then, as an editor, report harassment to. Um, what's fascinating about this is how much of that work is really done by people, um, but also how much of the work on the different language encyclopedias are also, again, done by people. And I think um, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to tie these two together because they're very different spaces. One of the things I find fascinating uh, as a technologist is how old Wikipedia is, how expansive it is, and how big it is, and how much of it is still done with human labor and how much of it is done with the acknowledgement that human infrastructure works really well. This does you know, raise this question of, well, what is, um, how do you create systems that don't create burnout when you're relying on human infrastructure? That's an incredibly hard question to solve. That's one of the things I'm, we're now trying to uh, work on with my team. Um, I'm a part of the anti-harassment tools team. But 
I think sort of coupling it and thinking about it, and this is something I often like to point out, with online harassment, sometimes what does work really well, sadly, is this like filter of human interaction, of human infrastructure, of a human moderator. But that does beg the question of what does moderator burnout look like? What does moderator support look like? And I'm, I know this is definitely subjects we've touched on earlier today. So. No, that's great. And in, in highlighting that phrase of human infrastructure, I think we also start to understand different approaches to the scale problem. So it's not necessarily, um, we've been talked earlier about sort of the challenges or opportunities of algorithmically based systems, but I think the Wikimedia Foundation, Wikipedia um, as a platform itself sort of show the power of this human infrastructure, but with that comes uh, sort of a responsibility to do the care work that's required to, to tend and make sure that that human infrastructure is still thriving and still there. No, that's a great point. Karen, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you, you spent time as a documentarian, you spent time with these moderators with who've been content moderators, yeah. yeah. Can you give us a sense uh, for people who maybe have seen the documentary or have not yet seen the documentary, but give us a sense of sort of where you were working, the kinds of people that you were uh, talking to and documenting and, and being there? Yeah, we went over to Bangalore in India. So we were given access to a company that were doing comp uh, content moderation. The only kind of proviso we had when we went over there was we weren't to reveal the list of their clients. But apart from that, they allowed us to wander around their offices for the time that we were there. We decided to use, when we were going over to film in the offices, the training process. So we felt most people watching wouldn't know about content moderation. So we were going to film one room. There was a group of new people coming in, I think 12 people. We we're going to film them. And then we we're also going to go into the other room where people were moderating content. And we we're going to film them as well over the period and just talk to them and interview. Um, the office itself was just in, off a kind of a, a very nondescript street in Bangalore. It wasn't like a high tech tech district. It was just a regular um, area. When we went in, what, the first thing that I really noticed that I thought was interesting, which really isn't in the film, um, was time. So like they're, they're moderating, none of the companies they're moderating are Indian. So they're moderating European or North American tech companies. So they have up on the wall all of these clocks that tells you the time in London, in New York, uh, in Moscow. And then they are in there 24-7, but the rhythm of the whole day is not about what's happening in India, but it's about what's happening around the world. So what I found really interesting was I could see peaks in the day, which was unrelated to what was happening in their you know, like what time of day it was in India, but like where Europe is awake, sorry, Europe is in the evening time and America is waking up. And you could see that they were quite busy. People were getting up and checking their phones. People were posting stuff. So their whole workflow was completely synced in with um, this kind of uh, parallel universe on the other side of the globe that they were cleaning and filtering up. And the work that they were doing, because so that's really what we wanted to kind of discuss, was the first thing that really struck me was a really kind of rudimentary uh, selection kind of, they describe it as like their, their film sensors. That was the easy way that the boss of the company said. So we censor, you know, photos that come in and some get like, you know, you know uh, a red card and aren't allowed to go on the site and others are categorized by different um, uh, certifications. But what I kind of noticed was that they were there Staff told us that they dealt with 2,000 images an hour, and it just was so quick, and it was just so rapid fire, and it was so much material coming down, and they're just clicking on uh, the mouse, and they're just like really, you know, after a while, they're really in tune with it. So to get tell, like within a fraction of a second, before I'd even figured out what was coming up on the screen, they were moving on to something else. But it was just this huge turnover of uh, material as they were working through it. And they all, there wasn't much uh, conversation or, communication uh, between the desks. They just were working, processing through that. The other things that they were kind of doing, so they would be searching for, they would be looking for like, the obvious kind of very low hanging fruit of what shouldn't be on a website. So child porn shouldn't be up there. When we were there, we saw instances where they'd come across with child porn. Uh, porn itself shouldn't be uh, there in certain sites. You were allowed a little bit more leeway depending on the site they were pulling out kind of um, sexually explicit material. Then they would have been taking a lot of like stuff like beheadings, you know, um, people with their, you know, quite graphic photos. 
So would, like they would have stories of if something would have happened, you know, like you know, a beheading or a famous beheading video that would have been in the news that might be kind of floating around in the office then for the next two or three weeks, popping up repeatedly on uh, sites or cycles. Um, so they were kind of dealing with it on that very kind of low level. And then on another way, they were also, um, they would have been interacting with um, like fraudsters and, you know, people who would have been kind of putting up fake dating website profiles and stuff like that. Um, and then the other aspect was we, we kind of set in with the people being trained, and that was kind of interesting. So, like, I think one of the big things was, like, they were, it's a completely different culture. So a lot of people there had, you know, were arranged marriages in India, but here was dating websites. So they had to familiarize themselves with what a dating website was in the first place. Um, a lot of people there, like, their religion would have been Hindu, so a lot of stuff that they would have been moderating would have been alien to their religion, but they were getting kind of pep talks, speeches about, you know, this is your religion, this is your belief, forget about that. You're a moderator. This is what you do. You forget about where you come from. You forget about your set of values. You know, and it was all based about whatever the clients, I think, you know, the set of guidelines that were given. And those set of guidelines would differ from client to client. So one person on one desk would be doing one thing, another person would be doing that. But it was basically they were following a set, uh, set of rules that were obtained from uh, the, whoever would have been uh, giving out the guidelines. Um, and I think in the final, I think the final thing was the, on the Thursday, they had a kind of a, which we found really interesting was where they started showing them just like pictures on board of what, what was allowed and what wasn't allowed, which at time verged into the surreal when they're showing up Brad Pitt saying like, he's a celebrity, but loads of people will be putting that up in their profile. It isn't Brad Pitt. He isn't joining this dead dating website. Take it down. But then on other sites, you have like beheadings, animal porn, all of this, and just their reactions, and yeah, you asked as well, like their reactions, they were, everybody in the room, it was their first ever job, uh, they were all signing on the very first day non-disclosure agreements, and the final thing I'll say about this, and I'll wrap it up, like, like, it's very, we found it hard to get access into somewhere where I was doing content moderation. This company were really, really good, in the sense that they allowed us to go in, they allowed us complete access, some of the stuff would have um, I would have found difficult. I would have been kind of looking at the, the clients, their staff, and you know, you, you would be able to draw your own conclusions. But also, what it kind of said to me on a spectrum of these companies, I think this is a pretty good company. This is a company that was allowing themselves, their doors to be opened, and them to be forensically examined by a documentary crew, and weren't in any way kind of interfering with us. But I think there's a lot of research, there's a lot of research being done by people speaking here. Adrian has gone to the Philippines himself. And you kind of get to see that there are a lot of other companies out there where it's a lot even darker. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. And I, wanna, I know there's people in the audiences too. I know that Sarah and I, Lily have done work on sort of the uh, number of different other sites where content moderation has happened. So there's an interesting point to think about. This is a spectrum of working conditions and a different set of kinds of people who've been there. Talia, can you tell us a little bit about um, the kind of work that I know you've been doing, you've been thinking about the role that content moderation can play in sort of journalistic practice and thinking about how that works within newsrooms and what kinds of either democratic or civic functions it can play within there. Yeah, absolutely. So as part of our work, we've chatted with a number of content moderators at news organization sites to try to understand better what they're doing and how they feel about the work that they're doing. And it's been a really interesting experience because there are so much variability in how news organizations think about content moderation. So you have some news organizations that are incredibly supportive of content moderation. They have staffs of a dozen or so people that are involved in moderating comments. And they're really working closely with that team and supporting that team in what they're doing. And then you have other news organizations, like local news organizations, where maybe the reporters are told, oh yeah, and in addition to everything you're also doing, could you also moderate your own comments? And we're not gonna give you any extra pay for that, but that's now a new part of your job. And that's a really different dynamic, and people respond really differently in those uh, circumstances. And when we spoke with some of the people at the local level who were doing the content moderation, some of their experiences were really uh, difficult to hear. So they, uh, those that were quite dedicated to doing it would say things like, oh, I, you know, before I go to bed, I find myself continually moderating the comments. It was almost as though they were addicted to doing this. Um, there was one gentleman who told me that a significant part of his job was now to look at the comments across the site, 
And he was saying that um, some uh, individuals who he had kicked off the site or kicked off the commenting platform were then really trying to find out who he was. They found out his phone number. They would try to call him at all hours of night. So he was really facing some significant harassment from that role that he had as part of his news organization. So I think there's a huge wide array of the way in which people orient toward commenting. But I also want to mention that I think that part of the message um, to journalists at a lot of mid-level or smaller news organizations right now is, here's another thing you have to do on top of everything else that you're supposed to do. And I think that the framing is really look for the bad actors and get them out of there or somehow kick them off or put them in bozo mode or something like that. And I think that this is a really problematic framing when we talk about commenting and thinking about how journalists are relating to the audience because the comment section are actually a space in which journalists and audiences can have a conversation and there can be moments of really productive exchange there. And if it's always being framed to journalists as this, here's another thing you have to do and get rid of the bad stuff, I think that we're actually missing an opportunity to create a relationship between audiences and journalists and thinking about this as a space as you know, go in there and find out what people have to say, ask questions, help them find the information if they're asking you a legitimate question. And we've done a couple of studies looking at that, demonstrating that there is in fact some efficacy to having journalists get involved in this space in how the audiences react. So I, I, I know that part of this is talking about the uh, detrimental aspects of moderating comments, and there certainly are those, but I also just want to emphasize that I think there's a framing component to this that we may be missing the boat by always talking about the negative sides, particularly for those that have a comment section that could be a moment of dialogue with audiences. No, that's a really important point. Actually, maybe I'll ask Annika to, to weigh in on that as well. Having both studied and now working at a news organization, how do, how do you see either your own organization or the ones that you've studied in the past viewing these opportunities for interacting with the audience? I think there's, there can be moments where some journalists, you know, either they're being sort of placed into this role even when they didn't necessarily know they were doing it. It might fit with the organizational mission of the news, of the news group, but it also can put journalists in these positions of sort of maybe feeling uncomfortable with how more or less to get involved in a conversation. And we've, you know, we've, we talked about it this morning, but this old sort of hobby horse or myth of objectivity and how do journalists grapple with that closeness to a story or distance from the story? Have you seen any sort of examples in ways that you think journalists are doing that either particularly well or not well in, in comment or engagement sections? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. So actually, this was long prior to my arrival at The Atlantic, but they had one of the most successful cases in media of a commenting community, which was ta Coates' The Horde. Um, I don't know if anyone here participated in it or is familiar with it, but it was an incredibly, it was a thriving comment community, and it was a space where, you know, ta would ask questions, he would acknowledge um, things he didn't know and ask his audience to fill him in. He launched this idea of the open thread at noon. It's, a lot of this has been written up elsewhere as, you know, a case study. Um, and it was really a space where, you know, members of the community would get together and start talking to each other. Um, and it was incredibly vibrant and successful and joyous. Um, and unfortunately, it did kind of, I think it became, again, prior to my arrival, but by the time I arrived, you know, the horde had kind of been spun down. And um, Tanahasi's profile had also increased dramatically as a writer. And so the kinds of commenters he was seeing um, had begun to change. And, um, but I think it was an example of how a community can function really well. Um, that said, I, I mean, it's... I think it's hard to think about how to replicate examples like that. I, I don't think that there is a methodology. Um, I mean, I think a lot of times we look for rules and we say things like, well, when you know journalists engage in comments, sometimes they're more civil. Um, you know, um, the ways in which people, um, you know, I mean, and there are signals you can send, and that's incredibly important work. But um, I think a really good comment community, like any good community maybe, is really a confluence of a bunch of different circumstances, many of which, you know, come together to create a unique situation. Um, and so I think that, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, the moral is it's hard to replicate. Um, and I will also say that, you know, I think... The challenge, one of the challenges I kind of observed and the reason that I think it was important to draw attention um, to sort of the challenging aspects of moderation is that at least a lot of the moderators I spoke to tended to be younger journalists and it was kind of one of their early jobs in the industry. Um, and so 
I mean, coupled with the fact that they were trying to break into the field, they ended up being in this position of really not being very empowered to talk about um, and influence policy around how comments were handled. And some were very passionate about comments and really were interested in having them there. And that was almost, um, in some ways, could be just as bad, if not worse, because you know you were very devoted to it. And I can think of an example of someone whom I spoke to who even um, a few years later was so scarred by the experience, basically said, you know, I just don't believe that, you know, a news organization today can have a productive dialogue with an audience in, you know, an online forum. I would love to believe that, but I can't. And so I think, and, and that's a rough thing to hear. I mean, that's somebody who came into this profession and had, you know, a lot of their faith shaken by, by what they went through. So, um, and I heard stories like that from a lot of people. So I don't know, um, which is not to say we shouldn't look for and create these meaningful moments um, and try and create really good communities. Wow, that was not a good answer at all. Um, that was great. It's called no easy answer. Yes. <laughs> Carolyn, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think my answer is a bit more hopeful. Um, <laughs> probably a, a holdover from being at the Coral Project, but I read the comments. Um, <laughs> totally. Um, but I think one of the things I found really fascinating when I started at BuzzFeed um, was uh, there was an internal online harassment like workshop. Um, a lot of different journalists had faced online harassment at BuzzFeed. Um, and what I noticed, and this is something I noticed from, again, small non-scientific survey I had done at the Coral Project where we had interviewed over 40 different journalists. Um, what I found really fascinating was a lot of spaces that had moderators, how journalists were unaware that there was actually a moderator until something bad happened. So that this wasn't a part of like the onboarding process of being hired at a space. Uh, it, took, it took a moment until journalists were being harassed in the commenting sections of their own articles for there to be this realization that there is a moderator. Uh, one of the things I found really fascinating at this workshop with BuzzFeed, for example, was uh, people went around and talked about all these different forms of harassment they had faced inside of the BuzzFeed CMS, and then I think BuzzFeed has removed comments, and then outside of that in uh, different platforms. But what was really fascinating was one of the moderators was there who's employed by BuzzFeed, and seeing how many journalists did not realize that they could actually actively engage with this moderator. Um, uh, and this moderator kept advocating again and again, like, if you're publishing something, you can just let me know the timeline. When is it going to go up? Like, let me know, and I can like I can put this into my workflow. And the reason I sort of bring that up is I wonder if part of the problem isn't just can we have spaces that are like fruitful and and full of debate and can be tenacious and angry and sad and can be like worthwhile? Is it also that that there's a something really simple that this is a process problem? Um, do we need to acknowledge that? Moder moderators are people we should hire and we should pay well and we should support and we need a fair amount of them and journalists shouldn't be moderators. But where do the moderators sit inside of the newsroom? Um, do they sit on a special digital team where they never interact inside of the, inside of the company org chart with journalists? How aware are journalists of like access of different things that they have? Another thing that popped up in the surveys we were doing is it wasn't until journalists had been harassed that they had realized that they also had access to mental health support. So all these other different things that are like not a part of something that is really basic of an onboarding process of being hired at a newsroom. So like, why aren't we also having these really basic conversations of what are all the tools at your disposal? And why don't we just be really upfront about like, these are the different support mechanisms we offer from paid sick leave to mental health support to this is what, you know, if you take time off to have a child, and then also, by the way, we have moderators and you should use them actively. Like, why isn't that a part of our process? So that's, I don't know, that's kind of my answer. I think that part of this is also very much a process problem in the ways in which newsrooms run as companies. Karen, did you see much of that process-wise in terms of either the care work or the kinds of, uh, you know, the description of the kinds of care process that Caroline was seeing? Uh, did you see that in your own field work or yeah, was like you mean in, in uh, India? In, in India, for sure. And, how, yeah. and the, like there was um, a woman there, she worked in HR, and she was kind of keeping an eye on everybody. So if anybody was feeling that they were um, affected, she would talk with them. I felt like, to be honest with you, they, they, there was a big training room there, and I felt like that first week was like this kind of natural selection where first, well, like, you know, where the first hurdle was, can you even 
cope with the idea of doing this. So they would kind of weed out people, and because they had the room there, they were just, there was going to be an awful lot of turnover there. Um, they did talk to us about being conscious of uh, employees' concerns, and like I did uh, imagine that like the people that were there would be chatting, but like the huge volume that they had, uh, there wasn't anybody bar one person who'd been over there over three years, there was a couple more longer, so I think being the fact that it was everybody's first job, it was none. I think they just see this as like a rite of passage where people go in and do it for nine months, do this kind of pretty hard work, and then a lot of them will leave. Some other ones will stay there. The other thing that I thought was interesting, I kind of touched on it with like Rajiv, and this is going to come, he kind of like was, he explained to the class when he was chatting to them his core belief about how they would moderate, and it was this kind of like idea that you can separate yourself when you're doing it and you don't let it affect you. And like from following him, he's, he was there, the guy that was there for three years, and he's doing, like he was, you could see that they would, people would come in and they wouldn't go straight into the hardcore. So we'd walk, we, when you're going across the office, you kind of know that the people down here were on very kind of mild stuff. Uh, up around here was kind of a bit more, and then like up in the top corner, it was all fairly hardcore. Um, so you wouldn't instantly come in and just be trained up, but they would kind of move you up there. But also I think it was just, he said that he could, you know, separate and do that separation. We tried to quiz him about it and try to get a reaction out of him. And he, like, I, I kind of believed him to an extent, but me, that would affect me. And that would kind of um, make me feel different about myself, and it would also kind of um, depress me. And I kind of, you also got to realize that they were allowing us in, and we decided to do the documentary on the basis of what happens within the four walls of their office. So, like, I'm sure if I asked you about this university, you'd be saying it's the greatest place on earth. But if we had five points, and then later at the end of the evening, you might be shaking your fist <laughs> when there's no camera. And so, like, obviously the staff might, um, on camera, might have just been kind of not towing a line, but they may not have been telling you fully what they felt about it. Now, there was some people that kind of said that they did feel... Um, some of the stuff, you know, 20% of the vul is vulgarity. Just the sheer volume of it was overwhelming at times. But I think there's a lot of research. Adrian has done articles where it kind of clearly affects staff and there isn't protocols in place mm. for them to be looked after. Yeah, I think a lot of that can be complemented to sort of long-term ethnographic work where people are spending, you know, months and months with folks and you can see shifts over time. You can see how different things have been yeah. approached. Um, Tali, I wanted to throw a slightly different question to you if I could, a bit of a curveball, and then we'll open it up to... Uh, to the crowd and ask some questions. Um, so given that you've been, you've been working in this context of thinking about how comments and moderation are working in a news context and how that can be both a sort of a civically engaging but also sort of organizationally complex thing to, to implement with news organizations, given that at least in, when some news organizations have shut down their comments, they've sometimes said, they've often said, um, well, that conversation is happening elsewhere, right? It's, it's happening in Facebook groups, it's happening at this. So we've just sort of, we've outsourced that function to those other kinds of places. And I'm wondering if you could sort of, you know, stitch together for us a little bit and say, given what you know about what works or what doesn't work in a news context, are there a set of recommendations or kinds of things that you might say to, to if we had some platform makers in the room, um, say to them, here's how you might treat news content differently, or here's how you might treat news moderation differently. Here are the kinds of things to build into either your designs, your affordances, your constraints, the kind of uh, labor that you might hire. H how might we port over some of the understandings that you've given us in news moderation into these other platform worlds where news organizations tell us that's where it's happening? Is, the, is there sort of lessons to be learned across there? Yeah, I mean, I think there are lessons that can be learned from what news organizations have done on their sites that can be imported almost directly into what's happening on social media. And I think we see some news organizations doing that directly, so doing similar sorts of work that they would do in their comment sections, but now doing it online, so on Facebook, uh, as an example. So uh, one example of that would be uh, we worked with a news organization and across 70 different days, we actually worked with them to randomize whether or not they were getting involved in the comments uh, taking place on their Facebook page on political posts. And we did this on their social media page, and we were tracking what happened to the comments there. And this goes back to the earlier comment, which is, this is hard. There is no magic solution to make all of this work beautifully. 
But what we found was what, that when a recognizable and well-respected reporter was getting involved in the comments on Facebook, there was about a 15% decline in incivility, and there was about a 15% increase in the provision of evidence. And by that, I mean that the commenters were more likely to offer some substantive r rationale for whatever their perspective might be. And we had a very low threshold for this. This wasn't like citing a journal article or something like that. So I think that this demonstrates that some of the techniques that you might use on a news organization site can be directly related onto platforms. And kind of the second part of your question is, are there things that the platforms should be doing or thinking about uh, to make news distinct or that, that might be different there? And I do think that there are some things that news organizations might consider, and even the basic affordances allowed for commenters in these spaces, I think should be thoughtfully considered and should be different in news compared to just what you're chatting with your friends. So when you're clicking and looking at the reactions available, again, I'm kind of picking on Facebook here, but if you look at the reactions that are available to them, uh, those might not be the reactions that we might want to provide people when they're thinking about news. So when you're thinking about news, do you really want to put an angry face or a like are there other things that we might want to import for a news context, like respect, or I respectfully disagree, or you know, other ways of thinking about this that might change the tenor of the discussion just by offering different affordances in that space? So that would be my recommendation, would be think more broadly about how the news context might differ from the way in which people interact with friends and family, and how that might be important in the space. Now, I'm asking something huge. The platform's don't want to do this for very good reasons, I suspect, because then that means differentiating between news and other things and changing what the platform looks like for that. But I think it's worth thinking about how the way in which people can interact on the platforms conditions the way in which they do. And if we give people the same way to do that with friends and family as they do with news, that has implications. And you can yeah. jump in. I was just going to quickly add that, yeah, there, while there is no magic formula, there are absolutely best practices. And, you know, we, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I don't know if anyone would say that the, at least, you know, the news industry has reached saturation point when it comes to understanding and adopting all of those um, in a really comprehensive way. We definitely have a ways to go. That's a great point. Okay, we got a little over 10 minutes. Uh, I wanted to throw it to the crowd, and I see a hand right up front. Uh, I think there's a microphone coming to you. Other folks be thinking of your questions uh, afterward. Um, to, to your comments about the think tank in Bangalore, or the, the moderation tank in Bangalore, um, mostly what you I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is there feedback in the room? You're OK. OK, good. Um, you were uh, mainly talking about pictorials and that they were very effective at uh, censoring child porn, very effective at censoring things like beheadings. So um, let's take other things in the news. Um, massacres are constantly occurring. So let's say this week's unfortunate massacre is uh, Turkey and the Kurds and Afrin. And people post um, on Twitter and I imagine on other platforms um, gory pictures, but they are, they're real, they're genuine. Uh, somebody else may be thinking, uh, I'm not getting enough attention. My, uh, my uh, concerns are important and valid and they're not getting enough attention. And it, something increasingly common is that people will take an old massacre from another area and post that as the massacre that's happening now. They may post something that happened in Libya and say that it's in Afrin. They may post something from Iraq and say, um, and it's very difficult for somebody to detect that sort of thing um, as quickly as saying this child porn does not belong here. Um, yeah, like I think my experience of the moderation company uh, co content uh, company that we were dealing with in India was that they dealt on a very kind of really basic level of what it was as they were, whatever set of guidelines they were given, they would uh, follow through. But the, the guidelines were always very, very uh, straightforward. You know, no uh, war pictures. 
uh, and maybe for a dating site, you know, in Russia, or it could be a social media platform. But whatever the different company can uh, change, and whatever set of gu guidelines they were given, they would adhere to them. But there was absolutely no nuance. Like that, they didn't. Like you know, they could be moderating in a language, or maybe um, English may not be the prim pr primary language of. So they may not even understand what is being said surrounding the photos on some of the sites or something like that. So. Like, I felt that there was no, like, I think like, a lot of people were discussing about, like, fake news and the ability for people to get in there and be able to investigate. It really, like, you're talking about the decisions that people were making uh, here were done in the fractions of seconds. And they would either tag something or they wouldn't. Um, but there was no, like, there, there would definitely not be, like, try, like, they, for, like, let's say, certain company, like, let's say they'd have high profile, maybe dating site or something like that, they may verify photos of people who are setting up profiles just to make sure that that person is real or something like that because they don't want somebody to be uh, scammed or something like that, which was a problem. But generally, like let's say on other sites, they were just flying through stuff and like it would be very, very, very quick. Like I'm talking 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and that would be it. Other hands. I want to put Lily on this, but was it, who, or Ashkan, did you have a question on this one? Or Lily, you got, on the last panel, you lost your time, so I wanted to offer you uh, the spillover time that, uh, that you didn't get on the other side. And then, and then over here, okay, yeah. There's a microphone behind you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so the last panel c question might not be tremendously relevant, okay. but it's short. So <laughs> I'll throw it out there, and then I'll make the comment um, that seems more relevant. Uh, to the conversation y'all have been having. So the last panel, they were asking for radical ideas and the radical, one radical idea some people are working on is an effort to, um, to have shareholders buy Twitter and turn it into a cooperatively run company. And so I was curious what people's thoughts were on kind of distributing ownership and control of platforms as a way of transforming the democratic governance of those platforms. It's not unrelated to the conversation we've been having. Uh, but That's um, super related, actually. Caroline. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Well then. I was like, wait, that's my question. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> Let's talk about Wikipedia. <laughs> um, one of the things I often like talk about uh, um, when I can talk about Wikipedia, whenever I can, which is all the time, um, is that there's this really fascinating thing we have called the community wish list, where you can suggest changes, and they're ranked and voted on by the entire community. Um, also, what I do as a member of the anti-harassment team, where I'm, I'm actually a design researcher and not a product analyst, oh. um, but that's My okay. Apologies. Okay. Um, is we engage in participatory design, so we share everything we're working on. You can follow along on any of the progress that my team is doing. All of our like tasks we have are are open. Um, but we ask the community constantly for feedback. Uh, we ask questions like, "We're thinking about researching X." What do you think about that? What are the gaps that we're missing? And then we go and we synthesize like the feedback and then represent it back to the community and say, like, so we took this feedback and we did this, this, and this. Are we going in the right direction? Um, the reason I really, really like this is if there's something wrong with something that's been built or if the community wants something to exist, there is a very clear pipeline towards getting that thing built and also vocalizing actually on various wikis, so on, on Wikipedia itself or on, on any Wikimedia project, feedback, so you can actually create change. But there isn't a people's forum of Twitter, for example, where I can, as a participant on Twitter, raise my hand and say, like, I think that this thing should be built, and this is how I would build it. Um, even actually moving forward with, with Wikimedia, uh, you can apply to have something built or work on a project, and then you can be paid to work on that. There's this whole process where we actually distribute grants back into the community to build things. So, so much of Wikimedia, that's the, how we reference all of our global projects, are, are actually built by volunteers. And what I like about this is you can be any kind of volunteer and have equity inside of a system. But we don't have equity inside of Facebook or Twitter in a way I can't provide, I can't organize my fellow um, Twitterians or Twitter users, right, and say, like, I have this great idea, let's vote on it, I'm going to spec out, like, the product plan for it, this is my proposal, this is who could build it, or this is how much money I would need with this kind of team to build that. We don't ever get that, that kind of equity. 
Um, so I guess the answer to your question is like, we should totally do that. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, but also, we can look towards a platform that's already existed for over 15 years, the Wikimedia projects, and see how sustainable that is, and I guess look towards that. I have a follow-up question with that, though, because with Wikipedia, yeah. um, it's don't, it's, it, it seems like it's necessary to talk about how these things are funded when we talk about how the sustenance and care of them is... Uh, you know, like how, what ends up being sustainable. Like I work on a system that's also been around for 10 years that thousands of mechanical Turk workers use on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's run by like two volunteers, uh, you know, system administrators, three actually now, and five moderators who are m not turking when they're moderating, so they're actually losing money and burning, and burnout's a constant problem. But um, we don't, we're not, you know, a bastion of democratic Future, so we don't have foundation funding. The people we serve don't have very much of an income to donate, uh, and we don't generate revenue like Twitter does. So I feel like the, the, maybe we need to be mapping different kinds of platforms that serve purposes in the public sphere and as institutions for labor and democracy, and then think about different sustainability models in those configurations. Can I, do you want to be quick, and then I'll get one more question in? Sure, I mean, I, I think that that's something we should absolutely do. I don't, you know, again, like, or rather, I don't think that there's a one-size-fits-all solution for every platform, right? Um, what, what does work for Wikimedia may not work for everything, but I do think it's important to talk about sustainability. Donor funding, what does that look like? Also, who gets to have the biggest voice in that room? Which is a problem every platform will have. That's a problem we definitely have on the various Wikimedia projects, right? Who can stay there the longest? Who can be the loudest? Um, but I, I do think it is important to like highlight what what are what are we thinking as sustainability inside of a community? Is it something that is really concrete, like an endowment? Is it something where it's like age? Is it usage? Is it like length of time? Like what are we sort of thinking as sustainable projects? Like Facebook is so big, but it's still so young. So coming from um, a product and a community and platform that's much much older, how sustainable is Facebook? when Friendster doesn't exist anymore and neither does MySpace. So like, what is the future of like, these community platforms, especially when we're starting to think about sustainability? Great, thank you. We have time for one last very quick question, I think. I think you had your hand up earlier. Hi. Ask you to hey. ask a quick one and a quick answer. I'll keep this quick. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, this is a very instructive panel. Um, I run a trust and safety team at Medium. We're small and scrappy, but we see our share of beheadings and other things every day um, get escalated to me at my phone. Um, I've looked at the literature on compassion fatigue, on decision fatigue. I've thought about ways to support the distinctive sense of humor that my team has developed um, from this work. I'm trying to find ways to support their work and their mental health. Based on the information that you've studied and the things you've seen, my question is just what should I do? Who wants to take that one? An Anika? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I'll quickly start, and then you can also jump in, um, and then anybody else. Um, I think there are probably a lot of different things you can do, but one of the things that I know um, that was mentioned to me by some moderators is like making sure that everyone on the team, senior and otherwise, understands and has the option to like tap out of work when they're having a bad day, and like there's someone else who's equipped to kind of step in and do something for them. Um, and then, and you may already be doing that. Um, uh, having like mental health resources available, again, you may already be doing that. Um, having discussions around like how to handle like difficult actors in the community, like kind of with context, um, and um, and again, allowing space for people on your team to talk about that. Uh, because again, I think the pace of moderation can be very rapid, and so kind of making interventions against that pace um, that allow space and time uh, for people to be healthy. Totally, and even building upon that, like. Um, one thing um, I've been sort of working on as, as an idea and something, I, an article I've been writing is, how do you think about um, triaging tasks and sort of labeling the emotional labor that occurs with certain tasks? And are you dividing up those tasks enough amongst everyone? Or is one person sort of dealing with like very um, intensive or high risk or high emotionally taxing work all the time? How do you also think about like even the day to day, not the amount of content you're going through, but the amount of kinds of content? Um, can someone take a break? Is that folded into their workflow where it's like, okay, so we look like, looks like we have a bunch of really intense level five tasks. 
Like, how can we distribute this in a sustainable way? Oh, did you work on that yesterday? That's something you shouldn't touch then. Like, how do you also think about, I guess, that kind of workflow? Um, and then again, I think allowing, as, as you point out, like lots of time for self-care and, and breaks. And also thinking about, I think, you know, even again, what are other tasks someone can be working on that also sort of allows for, for a different kind of pace, right? So um, I think it's like organization, like day-to-day -day workflow. I'm um, gonna get, oh, do you wanna have yeah. last little point? Then we'll... Last point, um, yeah, and also of course, pay moderators well and take totally their that, feedback into that. account when you're building the tools. Pay them a lot. Small, right, small point, right, exactly, no, but it's hard. Okay, I'm getting the time signal, so I'm gonna thank our panel and then we'll, we'll break and have some refreshments. Thank you.